Sandy, uh, listen, I, I know that you just went through a marathon press conference. At the end, you said we wore you out, so I promise <laughs> that I'll uh, I'll be brief here. But I do have a few more for was, you. And, and it's I was great kidding. To see you. They're not that tough. Okay, <laughs> you're not that tough. I was kidding. All right, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll go for another. What do you think? Half hour, forty five minutes work for you. Whatever. Now? <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Well, listen, Sandy. Let's cover um, everything so that baseball tonight uh, in New York, uh, you know can take the night off. Fantastic. Right? I love that plug right there, too. Um, so, listen, you know, we've we've certainly known each other for a number of years now. And, you know, maybe aside from that champagne shower after Game 5 in L.A. in 2015, this was probably the most excited that I've seen you. Uh, you know, generally I hate asking questions to rank how does this compare with uh, other moments, but you've been yeah. in baseball a long time. Where would you describe your excitement level now and your anticipation level about what could be versus other really exciting moments in your career? You know, it's interesting, Steve, because, uh, <clears throat> you know, excitement comes in, in, uh, in, in unusual places. Uh, I've been in the game for I don't know how many years, and we've won the World Series once. That was back in 1989. <laughs> Everybody else in the game goes home unhappy at the end of the season. Todd Zeal knows that very well. And so as a consequence, you got to find your excitement in different places. And today's one of those days for me, just because of the possibilities that are out there for the Mets and how that translates for Mets fans. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, Wilmer Flores. <laughs> being one of my great memories. That was exciting. The whole 15 season toward the end was exciting. But look, we, Steve's laid out a pretty aggressive schedule for us. We need to win a championship in the next three to five years. So uh, um, uh, I'm excited about the, the effort that we're all going to make to try to achieve that. And, uh, you know, Steve is going to pro provide the resources. I think he's going to provide the leadership just in terms of his enthusiasm and his commitment uh, to help make that happen. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, you mentioned the resources, and certainly that is the number one thing that's gotten the headlines and the pu publicity, the, the amount of resources that Steve Cohen is bringing to the table here. And I know that Mets fans think immediately about big ticket free agents and, and a payroll that's at the top of Major League Baseball. And while it certainly sounds like you guys won't shy away from those types of moves, uh, I think the trend in Major League Baseball is to really invest in everything else as well behind the scenes, the analytics, the, um, you know, the, the health and performance. When you look at your perfect vision for a sustainably great franchise, how much uh, would you allocate the importance towards payroll and how much towards building up and beefing up all these other things in an organization? Well, look, I, I think that, I think that uh, franchises that are sustainably successful uh, maybe boils down to two things. One is resources. I mean, you got to have the ability to compete for talent and in an ability to build out uh, your organization generally, which gets me to the second point, which is good decision making. And good decision making is, you know, not a, um, it's not a game of chance. If you can build, you know, if you, if you hire quality people and you build decision making processes that make sense and allow you to be methodical, not in your timing and not in, you know, the way bureaucratic and the way you approach things, but methodical, uh, rational. Um, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, I can remember the first checklist I got, by the way, today's the, uh, uh, 245th birthday of the Marine Corps. All Marines like to, uh, to tout their existence on this particular day, but I can still remember, uh, you know, SMEAC, situation, mission, execution, administration, communication. These are the kinds of processes, if you will, we need to create. So we're all checking off everything consistently. So consistent decision making and resources, I think, are really the key. And I think that, you know, Steve will bring the resources. And then what we have to do is create an environment, um, a capacity, build out our farm system, build out the business side, 
make sure we're doing all the things we want to do on social media, you know, running the gamut of an operation, but create the capacity and then a foundation of good decision-making across the board, baseball, business, what have you. Um, that's the way we're going to be sustainably successful over time. Sandy, that's a, a big job ahead to, to build that type of infrastructure. So in your mind, uh, you know, just how difficult is that and how long does something like that take until it really is up and running in full? Well, I don't think it's gonna take us that long. Um, let me give you an example of, of uh, something that currently I think is running very well within the Mets organization. So when I was with the Mets last in 2018, we decided to build out, I don't know what we called at the time, a performance group. This included trainers, sports scientists, strength and conditioning coaches, um, doctors, but basically a, an integrate, a group of integrated disciplines that would allow us to better uh, care for and strengthen and uh, rehabilitate our players. Steve mentioned about you know, keeping our players healthy. I really think the Mets have done a good job since 2018 building that out. And so, um, and I think that to some extent that's been reflected in um, the availability of players and, and, and a sort of a lesser rate of, of, uh, of injury. Uh, so that's an area where job and it didn't take that long to, to build it out. There's some things that continue to need to do to kind of uh, build that through the minor league system as well and make sure it's integrated well with, you know, the other aspects of our baseball operation. But it doesn't have to take that long. Uh, but it, it, it's going to require, you know, good people. And sometimes one person can make a big difference. Uh, it doesn't take a whole, you know, cadre of people. Sometimes great things are accomplished just through one person, uh, strength of will, uh, curiosity, and, um, and then having the res requisite sort of uh, resources to make it happen. Sandy, um, the first thing you said today was that you have spoken with Luis Rojas and you said that he should prepare himself to likely be the manager next year in 2021. Not 100 yeah. percent, but but likely. Why was it important for you to speak with Luis and give him this update? Uh, and just I know you weren't here last year, but watching from afar and speaking with people that you know were holdovers from your regime as well that were here last year. What do you feel um, Luis was able to do and how he was able to navigate a, a very, very unique situation a season ago? Well, let me back up a little bit and give you kind of a general answer to the question about managers. I, I really believe that uh, managerial leadership in the game, and this would be true of a lot of leadership positions, um, it's, it's, a, it's a function of professional competence and, on the other hand, personal qualities. And I really think that, you know, to have a long running success as a manager, it's as much about the personal qualities as it is about the competency. Look, you gotta be able to make, you know, the decisions during the game. And uh, your credibility as a leader is partly gonna be a function of that. But uh, in order to do it for a period of time, you really have to be a quality person in order for people to identify with you to respect you to accept your decisions and you know good or bad and uh and move on and so i think louis has the personal side nailed down he's a he's a great person i've known him for a long time he has those qualities that engender um, respect and loyalty and uh commitment you know, sometimes you win or lose not based on individual performance. It's the commitment that players have to their teammates and to their leadership. I think Louie's got all that. Um, he would probably admit that he's got a lot to learn as a manager uh, of a major league team between the lines. But honestly, 
that's the easy part. And, and we need to make sure that he has people around him who can help that help him do that. So the only reason I didn't shut the door on all this speculation is because we're, we are going to hire somebody on the baseball side and they need to have some input into this decision. Um, but, you know, it's very difficult for somebody in his position um, to just be hanging out there for days and days and days. This is one of the reasons that, you know, last Friday we made some of those decisions, which, which seemed precipitous to, to some, but I think needed to be made. You know, I, I think that people were anxious. And uh, so uh, you, you really have to understand that human element too and respect it and try to be as forthcoming as possible as soon as possible. Sandy, I'm going to finish with this one. Um, I think one of the big storylines in Major League Baseball over the last number of years has been the fact that, you know, Mike Trout is a generational type talent and the Angels have been unable to put the team around him to take advantage of that. You have right now in Jacob deGrom, a generational type talent, the best pitcher in baseball pitching right now in his prime. Is there an added feeling of responsibility in this moment because of that fact to make sure that you guys don't waste another, you know, couple of years with this asset? You take advantage while you have him in this moment. I think the answer is, you know, yes and no. Um, obviously, Jacob is an incredible um, pitcher, athlete, and we've benefited from him over the last few years, and not in terms of team success, but uh, you know his individual performance. And you know, and to a large degree, there is uh, a desire, sort of an urgency to um, to take advantage of those years. But that's true of, of, of some other players too. Um, you know, we've got. Uh, Michael Conforto, who to me is sort of a prototypical Mets player, which I've really thought since since the time he came up in what 2015. Uh, we've got some other players who are you know in the midst of careers and and you know under the under the system we don't have them for that long, uh, and so um, there's an urgency very definitely, and it relates to Jacob Degrom, but it relates to some of the other players we have as well. Um, you know, there's a there's an expiration date on our ability to keep these players um, currently, and uh, you know we want to make sure that that um, yes, we're able to you know retain them longer term, but recognize that anything can happen and and take advantage of their abilities and talent right now. Sandy, uh, so great to see you once again. So great to talk to you once again. Um, first of many in the near future. So uh, thanks so much again for the time, and, uh, and I look forward to chatting again soon. All right, Steve, take care. Right, you look you good in a tie, by the way. Say that again? You look good in a tie. Hey, only the best, only the best for you on this day. Yeah, okay. Don't expect it much moving forward.